My dad uses the same joke. <laughs> Does this go any higher? No? Can you guys hear me? Kind of. Hello? All right. Is that okay? Cool. Okay. Um, so, I'm Matt. This is a talk about how we came into uh, Backbone at Pitchfork. So we're about to redesign the site right now. Um, before I start, are you guys all kind of familiar with what we are? No? Okay. Uh, online Music Magazine. And first off, this is who I am. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the VP of Product over at Pitchfork. Uh, I was their first full-time developer. Now I'm managing a team of four, including myself. Uh, and so we build Pitchfork, which is the most influential music magazine on the internet, the only place that matters. <laughs> Uh, so we were founded in 95. Um, in uh, 99, our founder moved to Chicago. Uh, really, in true blogger style, actually moved out of his parents' basement um, and moved to the big city. Uh, Pitchwork was kind of started on the premise of getting free music tickets and uh, being able to get backstage and meet his like mid-90s rock and roll heroes. Uh, it worked, and um, around the year 2000, we really started like hiring writers and getting traction. Uh, our president joined, and now we've got a film site, a fashion site, um, two festivals, one in Chicago, one in Paris. Uh, we've got a magazine called The Pitchwork Review. It's quarterly now. Uh, we've got a weekly app. We've got a bunch of other stuff going on. So safe to say that it has grown uh, pretty wildly in the last 15, almost 20 years now. Um, so I've been there for about five and a half, six years. Um, it's, it's been pretty wild to see it go from kind of a, a really broken Drupal site that I inherited that had like Ruby objects serialized into the database and a Drupal module that deserialized them. Uh, the site went down like honestly every 20 minutes and uh, the, yeah, it was pretty rough. Um, and so we, we totally rebuilt it uh, with this stack. So the, the first rebuild of it um, took it to Django and it was more about like normalizing the database and just keeping the website online. Um, and then it went to having like nicer tools for the editorial team who had never really had publishing tools before. They were just kind of given like that Drupal style uh, tiny MCE editor in the middle of a page. Um, after that, we started to really build out the dev team. And with that came um, the ability to do a little bit more interactivity with the website. So when we got to the point where we wanted to um, really move things along, we moved to jQuery, which you know everyone else eventually does, uh, and then we kind of found Backbone, which is pretty amazing. Um, the site's built with Django, and uh, Varnish sits in between, uh, and this is kind of the story of how we came to meet Backbone and where we went with it, and why it's so like deeply integrated into our stack. It is a little intimidating to have uh, uh, the 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 author of Backbone just kind of like surrounded by no one. <laughs> Slowly eating breakfast in front of me, but that's cool. That's cool. So, <laughs> in the beginning, Pitchfork was not terrifically interactive. Uh, we still take a lot of shit for not having comments and stuff like that. That's kind of the interaction we were super slow to get to. But um, when I say not interactive, I mean like you couldn't do anything. You could search, and that was it. Uh, we also had this review where you could enter your own score for In Rainbows, totally clowning Radiohead. They were devastated. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we, we, we started this redesign I was talking about. And um, after the dust settled, what we really wanted to do was uh, build a site that we wanted for ourselves. Um, the cool thing about Pitchfork is everyone there, like in the end, really just listens to music all the time and really loves it, kind of contrary to popular opinion. Um, really, really do like love music. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, and so we, we started this kind of like weird trip down the road of figuring out like as readers, what do we really want out of the site? Uh, what can we improve that we have right now and how can that like parlay into bigger, better things? Um, so some of the features that we started to build were a site-wide audio player, uh, which was our first big like foray into Backbone. I think that's still on the Backbone like um, use cases page. I'm looking right at you. Yeah, sweet, okay. Um, and then the next step was to kind of take that and like put it around the site so that um, anywhere that we like linked to an MP3 or even talked about it, we could have that as like, you know, perfect context. And that moved on to having um, what we call Advance, which is um, uh, our album pre-release platform. So bands you know, a week before the release, a week before we stick our score on it and uh, either make or break their career, uh, <laughs> we'll uh, 
trust us with their albums. They send us artwork, which is always like super cool. This one is from Hercules and Love Affair, which is uh, one of the better uh, animations that they sent. I'll show you a little more at the end of it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, this this is one of the more like fully fledged entire apps. This is probably as close as we've had on Pitchwork.com to like a single page application. Um, but really, like everything here in the UI, from the like slideshow I'll show you later to the tracks module to the navigation, is all just backbone views. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a there's the video playing. There you go. Yeah. And we did things like live search. That was pretty cool. And then we moved on to pretty cool stuff like cover stories. Uh, so. I don't know if you guys saw this. We did a we did an interview with Richard D. James from Apex Twin. Guy doesn't really give to be interviews, so that was a lot of fun. And he was really focused on the idea of the hive mind. Um, I think he was probably about ten years too late to kind of getting back on the internet or being social again. So most of the world had moved on, but he was pretty fixated on that. Um, and so what we did for him was a, a big like six part interview. And uh, the animation here is. Um, uh, the heat map. So everyone that was reading it and like hovering over the navigation would have their mouse tracked through a Node.js app that was pumping this back in through a WebSocket. Uh, and then we used WebGL for the heat map. It was pretty cool. But again, this is just a backbone view. The whole thing was just a collection of backbone views. Uh, and that really like simplified everything. And that's really the point of this kind of talk is that Backbone, when we found it, immediately gave us the structure and support and even some like stability that we really needed and in some cases didn't know that we needed. Um, we found that like the simplicity of everything involved as well as how lightweight it was really just dropped in perfectly into what we were looking for. Um, and that drop in philosophical compatibility is, is so like rare and often like a good, <coughs> excuse me, a good predictor of like success to come. So it was love at first sight. So Backbone really crept into everything, and here's how that happened. Um, so I like to call this the progressive enhancement of the website. So like I said, the first thing is that we had this audio player, and that was that was like what sold us on Backbone. That was also our big like you know gateway drug into building uh, more interactive components for the site. Um, after that, we realized that we needed to really like have virtual page loads. Um, at the time, the term PJAX did not really exist. So I, I guess it's PJAX because what we're doing is loading the page, extracting part of the DOM, and then updating our DOM with it. But we're doing it for the whole page. Um, and then we started with the cover stories, which I talked about. Uh, and again, those are more organizationally structured by Backbone. Um, instead of you know using such uh, deeper components like collections and models. But uh, at the end of the day, it is still just a backbone. Um, and then it really did spread to everything. Uh, so first off, I want to give an example of the site-wide audio player. Um, like I said a couple times now, that's the biggest. So I figured it would kind of do a, a quick and deep dive into that. Um, in the beginning, we had a widget from Yahoo, who has the same shade of purple, I think, that I'm using. Um, Yahoo used to be great for cranking out like tiny widgets that were totally need based. And I think every like music blog on the internet used this because you could just drop in a line of code and you had an MP3 player. It would look for any anchor tag that linked to an MP3 file and suddenly like it had everything. And it would preload the ID3 data from the MP3 and it looked really nice. Uh, but, you know, as all things do, it died. Um, doubly so at Yahoo. Um, which sucks, but uh, yeah, so so we got like an email from their dev team saying like, hey, just so you know, this is going away. Uh, it was very nice of them to reach out, and it definitely gave us a head start. Um, so we started building our own library called Tuning Fork, and that was based on Sound Manager 2. And as, as we started going, you know, it started to look a little messy, uh, and then we realized like, well, you know, maybe we could just backbone this up a little bit. Um, so... Here are the requirements we had. Uh, I should preface this by saying that at the time uh, that we started this, one of our competitors, a website and a print magazine called Spin, did a press release, five paragraphs talking about this brand new site audio player that they were going to be building. And I, we were kind of looking at this from like, oh, all right. So uh, I think in our own heads we created this like little arms race against them over like an audio player, which is one of those things <laughs> with enough distance you really look back on and you're like, oh, that was, that was fun. But uh, at the time, it seemed like really serious. And so <laughs> like we, we put all of our engineering heads together and, uh, and came up with the player. So we, we kind of sketched out like this. Um, we needed to have tracks playable from every source um, because the, the biggest thing that I wanted to accomplish with this was getting rid of every like iframe embed that was being sent to our team. And we were getting them from like every angle. Everyone had their own style of embed. And you would load the page, and it would just take like fucking forever. Pardon my French. 
um, to load. And it would, you know, things would be jumping up and down, and nothing was in an iframe. They were all on object tags, and it was just a disaster. Um, so I wanted to do away with that for performance reasons, and then we wanted to also just encapsulate everything and have it like running through a streamlined UI. So we needed to support several different backends. Um, YouTube we used to support until they sent us a very polite letter followed by a very uh, mean cease and desist letter. Um, my advice is don't ever try and play anything um, without showing the video for it. They're not cool with that. Um, yeah, so so we also need pluggable uh, you know playback engines. Um, we want to use HTML5 audio whenever possible. That only works for like MP3s over HTTP. Uh, which was cool because it worked with SoundCloud, but not Bandcamp, and um, worked with some of our stuff. But other times, you know, like Universal Music sends us an MP3 that we can't offer for a download, which means we have to stream over RTMP, which is cool because then you have to get on a call with people from Universal and try to explain what RTMP is. And, and really, all they want to hear is it can't be downloaded easily. Um, but they, like, read somewhere that it can, and it's, it's, not, it's, not, worth, it's not worth anyone's time. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we also want playlist support, and uh, playback should be able to be started from anywhere. And I'm sure if you guys are looking at this, you, you can probably figure out that, like, it translates really easily into Backbone. And so instead of inventing our own systems for this, we just thought, like, well, hell, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of a view library, right? But why, why don't we just use Backbone for this? So a track, Backbone model, playlist, a collection of models. Who knew? Um, the play controls, which is kind of like the, the uh, headless controller, we just used a backbone view for that. It didn't have to be a view, but uh, as you'll see, one of the themes that we have here is that we just use backbone views for classes. They're so lightweight that you know we, do, we just don't even care. Um, and then the UI itself, classic backbone view use case. So track, uh, to kind of justify each one of these. Um, so track has attributes, an ID, an artist name, title, and a playback source, which is like its SoundCloud API URL or its Bandcamp URL or some RTMP URL. Um, and then it has just like on the model the ability to resolve itself. So that means calling the SoundCloud API. That means calling the Bandcamp API. That means figuring out what the streaming uh, server is for RTMP, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really it. Um, to me, it sounded like a perfect use case for a model. Model perfectly encapsulated everything. Uh, we kind of bent the rules, but um, you know, no harm, no foul. Playlist again, total classic collection, right? So you stick your models into it, and it gets the uh, here's the pun, cursory, next previous. That's for you. <laughs> Get it? Uh, yeah. So it can move back and forth and in the playlist, and that's really it because that's all you really have to do in a playlist. Um, good use case for a collection. Now the controller is the uh, Chromeless intermediary between the UI and the tracks in the playlist. It's responsible for queuing, controlling, and signaling playback. Um, Backbone.events, pretty rad. Uh, and in this case, we used a view because it was kind of classy. That's two. Uh, the UI thing you click, it's pretty cool. Uh, so the UI just sends more actions to the controller. And then it listens to updates from the controller saying like, all right, you hit pause. I'm going to tell you to pause and now show, you know, respond to the pause event, turn the play button or turn the pause button into play to tell the user that it's been paused and they need to restart actions again. Um, that's really it. That's, that's the sum of the player. Uh, the UI was manifest in three different ways. All of these are UIs that talk to the controller and the controller responds and sends messages back to uh, other things that listen. So on a page you have, you know, at any given time, all three of these. If you go to our home page and you click the, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse up here, I have my mouse over the soft moon which is highlighted with the uh, orange play button. If you were to play that, then in the center our little HUD will show that it's playing and you get the progress report. And if you open the uh, collapsible player you will also see a more um, uh, robust playback interface all happening and that's all just channeling through really like a vanilla backbone setup but the advantage to us is that it was super simple to write and we got a lot of functionality out of the box however the site web player huge success time on site skyrocketed I mean like double tripled for a while depending on what we were doing anytime we posted a metal mp3 huge <laughs> I, I don't know what it is man like yeah and it's, it's not just black metal by the way it's all metal like the floor is eight and the ceiling is like the upper stratosphere. There's only like two, two, two people reviewing it too. I don't get it. But uh, okay, so huge success except that the first thing we heard back was the first thing we expected. When you click a link, playback stops. And all of the emails said, I didn't want playback to stop. I just wanted to click this link. And we thought, well, that, that was obvious. 
Uh, so huge bummer, and uh, we decided to do it with that. And uh, the first response, you know, was okay. We'll just add push state. However, this was a while ago. Push state still, eh, you know, it's a good choice now. Back then, no, not at all. Um, it was a little dicey, uh, and we, at the time we were considering dropping support for older IEs. We still try and support IE9 to some degree, but we're going to drop that and then redesign. Back then, IE8 was the like contentious choice. Um, we thought about throwing hashes into the mix. Um, Illinois has not legalized hash changes yet, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> seriously though. Um, yes, like social networks and SEO just totally, totally bombed on it. Um, so we, we tried it for a little bit and just stripped it back out. And then we had that glorious, uh, also probably hash-inspired idea. Let's just run the site through an iframe. Yeah. <laughs> Don't run your site through an iframe. So we, we actually re-engineered the site, which was not a terrible amount of work. Um, to run entirely out of an iframe, and all the page changes and uh, and uh, actions were just proxied up to like window.top, and there was a, a like a headless controller up there. Um, clever as it may have been, uh, it was definitely not the right thing to do, and we got we got some mileage out of it until uh, one day, ignoring that the complexity had gone up, we we pushed a CSS change, and Chrome completely freaked out, and the uh, site for about five minutes when you went to pitchfork.com for any page stroked violently. Um, I mean, like, you could be sitting in broad daylight, and the light would, like, you could see the light splashing on and off of your face, and uh, I mean, people were, like, super chill about it on Twitter, I, I gotta say. So, like, w w um, while uh, two of us were looking into what went wrong, uh, one was kind of looking at Twitter, like, yeah, yeah, people are definitely seeing this, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, somebody's like, wow, I don't know what they're doing, but this is great. It's much better. It's like, Thanks. Uh, so we ran uh, very apologetically uh, back to uh, Backbone and uh, implemented um, a route. And when I say a route, I mean we have exactly one route. And it's that, uh, <laughs> it's that, it's that PJAX style uh, page loading I was talking about before, where we just render everything on the server side as if we didn't have routing, um, and then take the, uh, take the HTML, extract what we want, and throw it into the DOM. And the cool thing about that is we did not have to worry about anything like uh, uh, switching ads between pages, uh, calling refresh there, reporting any false page views, um, really anything like that. Uh, we, we got a bit of a speed up because we also used um, just a simple page cache, which is like a super low TTL, kind of based on how we saw people moving back and forth in the site. Um, you'll never guess this, but the page in the page cache is a model, and the page cache itself is a collection. Yeah, it's pretty red. Um, yeah, and so we found that actually like sped up the site a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and just to really like wrap it off, we gave it the name Audubon, and we gave it an off-ramp so that uh, if we had pages that we didn't want to transfer uh, with the virtual page load, uh, specifically if we were taking you from like a page where you're listening to music to a page where you don't want to be listening to music, like Pitchfork Advance or to our TV section, um, you know, we, we could block that virtual page view and just send you like with a real page refresh that stopped audio playback. Um, and then, you know, if, if something goes on, uh, on the fritz between page views or you're going to a page that just doesn't exist anymore, um, the, uh, the the router will actually kind of like try it a couple of times before giving up and then giving you like a nice like uh, um, kind of like a little more decisive than that message saying that it just couldn't be loaded. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, the router just intercepts the link click, checks the off ramp, checks the page cache, and then when it does load the page, it fires the load event. And that's important, let me skip this one, because analytics are important. And when you just replace the DOM, you don't re-trigger any of the like script tags that are loaded on like actual page load, right? Um, so what we needed to do is make sure that that load event fired. And uh, when we grab that, then we simply recall all of the analytics again. Uh, that just lives in a backbone view, thanks to backbone events. Uh, we're just you know, shuffling this stuff all around. Um, Again, very easy. There are other load events that we have for custom ad integrations that need to do this. Um, I don't know if you guys ever work with advertising, but we're an advertising supported site. And like ad serving is the least civilized corner of like internet technology. And so there are a ton of like edge cases for that. And uh, really like for virtual pages like this, you just need to be ready for anything. Um, that load event really 
lets us hook into anything we want. So now we have a great player and uninterrupted playback as readers move through the site. Uh, we have seamless virtual page loading with accurate history management. We don't we don't mess with the back button. Um, no analytics dropouts, which is just probably more important to everyone else uh, at the company than keeping the site up. Um, and we have a very fast site. And what's more is none of the code that we wrote here stretches the imagination. So this is great for onboarding new people. If we get an intern, they can come in. If they've never used Backbone before, they look at it, they go read the docs, and they say, like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And that's, like, the most beautiful, you know, thing. It's a lot less oversight we need to give new people. It's a lot less, like, uh, you know, when we re revisit something. Some of this code's, like, four years old, you know. We come back to it. We don't know what the hell we were thinking. Uh, but we know that it was sensible, and we know that, uh, you know, it only takes a couple minutes to reread it, and we're exactly where we were before. Uh, so the low complexity leads to high productivity. And Backbone has since spread to cover just about any clickable module on the site, probably powered by a Backbone view. Uh, we have an async ad loading infrastructure. Uh, like I said, the civility of loading ads, highly questionable. Um, a lot of the time, you will not get from your ad server any indication that an ad is going to load. Also, people use ad blockers. Shame on all of you. Um, it's not a fun game, uh, <laughs> trying to catch up with that. But um, yeah, so so when an ad is like possibly going to load, we need to make sure that the space is reserved. And when we when you have a design that's like harshly gridded out, like our current site is, you want to have some like kind of backfill ready. Um, just having kind of like another headless controller listening for ad loads got us a really long way to reserving space on the page, but also culling any space that would have been occupied by an ad that also required like padding or decoration to separate it from the content. So ad doesn't load, goodbye. You know, you're gone for that container. Uh, ad does load, you have your reserve space. It's okay. Creates a little bounciness on the page. It could definitely be improved, but um, it, I mean, it works pretty well. Uh, and then our cover stories, um, as well as long form, which is um, a story builder. I was I was going to talk about long form. It's a little uh, a little nascent right now, but um, if anyone's interested in talking about that later, definitely hit me up. Um, the gist is that we've we're moving away from a kind of a traditional CMS where you just have a form, and into something with like more atomic blocks of content. Uh, but I do want to talk about cover stories because those are always fun. Um, so our cover stories were an effort uh, by Devon Design to kind of like reciprocate the love that editorial puts into their content. Um, there are a lot of features that, you know, deserve like some attention. Not all content is created equal. And um, especially right now where we're seeing like beautiful designs made easy for anyone to use, um, we wanted to do something a little more special to kind of call it out. So the implementation of this, each cover story really, like when you, when you just look at the code, it's a set of panels. And each panel kind of has its own responsibility. Uh, sometimes those panels are like parallaxing, sometimes they're video, but really like they only care about themselves. Um, we didn't have to use Backbone for this. The, the attraction to Backbone was one, we knew it, two, it was like so light that it just wasn't even like a performance concern. Um, and three, like the, the organization, again, totally compatible with how we wanted to align things. Um, so it, it, I mean, it just felt right. Like I said, section views pretty selfish. They only care about themselves and they only like work when they have to. Um, no one here is like that though, I'm sure. So um, like I said, views are light is what it is. Um, I've got a couple videos, but I also preloaded the pages. So I thought it might be cool to just show you guys kind of some of these things. Uh -oh. Oh man, all right. Okay, so resizing that totally uh, changed it, but that's cool. You guys see that? All right, so what we're looking at here is a streaming, um, streaming music kind of like a state of the union. I'm gonna try and reload this just because it looks like the new dimensions in Chrome are not compatible. Anyway, I'll go to this one. Um, how to dress well as an artist. Uh, are you guys familiar with him? He's out of Chicago, yes? Okay, he does kind of like a somber 
fractured R and B thing. Very, uh, very emotional. Um, so we, <laughs> what? <laughs> so we did an interview with him. Uh, he he kind of talked about his life a little bit, uh, about his life with his brother, who I, I guess is a little troubled. Um, he kind of talks about how he doesn't like talking about it. Um, it's, I mean, it's a good interview, but um, so the approach for this is that you know this landing page is a backbone view. It only cares about itself. So as we start scrolling, we get another one that brings in the text. And the video background here, that's kind of changing, I guess it's not static, um, is part of that view. So this view only cares about the text and then handling the changing the video based on its height as we scroll. So now we're gonna come to this. It's another backbone view that only cares about swapping this stuff out. Um, so again, it's looking at its height. And it's figuring out what do I need to do to render this? How do I need to blur it? And this theme kind of plays on throughout the entire piece. This is one of the more simple ones, I think. Um, one of the more beautiful ones, though. But I hope you can kind of see quickly um, how we were able to go panel by panel and just kind of assign responsibilities and set it off on its own. We didn't need to worry about it after that. Let's see, isn't that inspirational? <laughs> <laughs> It's cool. Uh, so I'll show you this one, so I think this is still loading. So this is our conversation with the FX Twin. Um, the premise of this is that for, uh, for those of you who have not seen his new um, album cover or are familiar with him, he um, has made a visual career out of just like ripping his face apart for his album covers, and it's like kind of the visual identity he's done. So for this one, it was, uh, it was like a close-up of his eyes and then a close-up of his like nose and then a big close-up of his mouth. And so what we did is we have a, a backbone view here that just interacts with the camera and uses, oh, this interface here. So submit it, and it chops it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he got a kick out of that. That was cool. Um, so the interview itself, and then we come back to this heat map, uh, which is showing the like real-time mouse data of anyone else looking at this right now. Um, so if somebody is looking at anonymous tips, they're probably clicking into it. I'm gonna click onto that one. That's just another like view being popped into, uh, into the stack. Uh, as you scroll through, we have something here. Um, we just use some backbone models to load in uh, from a backend API uh, that spits out other people's uh, faces. So like when you, when you go to there and you hit uh, submit it, it actually does take your picture and shuffle it off to the back end. Um, and then we bring it back out and show different people around uh, the interview. So, but then you also see yourself from time to time. So if I were to reload this, it would get somebody else's picture. Um, I think if I go to another section, we'll probably load it. That's yeah, a sliver. But anyway, um, yeah, so again, like in this case, it's not so much, so much about using like backbone for the sake of using backbone. It's just that like it really helped us organize this stuff uh, super like cogently. And that's really important when you have a ton of functionality. So this doesn't look like it wants to load yet. Anyway, I'll show you the UI parts of this. Maybe not. That's a bummer. Okay. Well, the streaming story is cool because this is actually like a real uh, application style interface. You, as you navigate through the story, you get this, uh, you know, streaming music service-esque um, player UI. You have a menu over here and then you can flip from light to dark. Um, there are also a lot of like just great canvas animations on this. It's a shame that it's not loading. Um, it should not have let it resize. Anyway, um, yeah. So I hope that kind of illustrates, you know, getting a lot out of a little with that. Um, oh, I do have an animation of it though. So here's here's what it would look like. So this is as you're scrolling down the page. Everything kind of comes together again, panel by panel. We can separate this. One person can work on you know that streaming view and their own view um, and then pull it together. Somebody else can be working on this. It really helps us like break the components apart. The other nice thing is that because it's so simple, it really stays out of our way. Um, a lot of the complexity in this is in the SVG animation. Um, and really, like, you don't want to have to worry about something interfering with the DOM or trying to, like, take control or, or bend your will to its organizational principles. 
So I'm going to let this play out for a second. Right. So these are different UI components. You can skip around the story. And that's it. And so that's really the story. Uh, backbone fed our needs out of the box, conception and physically. It has been love at first line of code uh, and gives us the first class functionality we needed without um, you know, introducing any weird, I don't know, problems, which is <laughs> really nice. So cool. Um, I hope you enjoyed this or got something out of it. If you want to say, hey, I'm around. If you don't, that's cool too. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your conference.